thank you to the university and particularly to the Katz Center for the invitation to come here. It's always a pleasure to come to Chicago. Uh, the very first time I ever came to Chicago, I realized this as long ago as something like 39 years, uh, when it wasn't so pleasant, it was in August 1968 at the height of the Democratic Convention, which is the first time I ever encountered tear gas. Subsequent <laughs> welcomes have been much more pleasant, including this one. And it's particularly good now that you have this CAT Center, which of course attests to the uh, great contribution to Mexican studies, the Mexican history of, of Friedrich Katz, and of course also of a number of other scholars who've worked in this university. I will be making reference to a few of them in the course of this paper. I assure you they are not contrived references. They were there in this paper before I ever knew I was coming here. Now the paper itself discusses the rise and fall of the myth of the Mexican Revolution. It discusses the rise much more than the fall, but in the last uh, 10 minutes of probably a 60-minute talk, I will get round to the fall, partly to interest those of you who may be more interested in contemporary recent Mexico than the, the history. Now, the paper was originally written a few years ago and has been given in one or two other places. I am fairly sure none of you will have heard it because it's not been given in big conferences, and this may be the last time before it finally gets rather belated publication. It was written for a conference uh, sponsored by the journal Past and Present, which I'm involved in, and uh, rather unimaginative, the conference was about past and present, which doesn't leave out very much. Uh, and I was drafted onto a panel on revolution. So we had Mexico, China, Russia, past and present, which meant how do revolutionary states uh, try to use or repudiate history? That was the kind of brief we were given. So that's why I did this. Um, and there are really two elements to this talk. Uh, partly it discusses the formulation of the myth of the Mexican Revolution. Now, I don't have any fancy definition of what the myth is, or indeed what a myth in general is. I did look at literature on myths, and a lot of it had to do with religion. And although some people talk about the civic religion of the Mexican Revolution, I don't find that an entirely helpful way of looking at it. Uh, and so I take the myth just to be, as many of you know who've studied Mexico, the sort of bundle of ideas, images, icons, slogans, perhaps policies, which became associated with the Mexican Revolution as it developed. That's what I'm talking about. I don't have any more uh, refined definition. So I'm talking partly about the formulation of that myth, which is to some degree a top-down exercise. It looks at the policy makers who tried to create a myth of the revolution. In that respect, it follows quite a lot on the work of Tom Benjamin, who wrote a very good book, La Revolución, uh, about this. I don't disagree much with him. However, he more or less just looked at the top-down approach. I'm also in the second element, trying to look at how the myth was received or internalized or rejected, because after all, that is what is important about myths. It's not just the making of them, it's the practical consequences. So I'm trying to have both, as it were, look at it top-down, bottom-up, the sort of dialectical approach which has become quite standard for lots of Mexican revolutionary studies. And I will be arguing, to the extent there is a sort of coherent overall argument with a conclusion, that the revolutionary myth took rather longer to create than sometimes supposed. It was more piecemeal, probably in many ways more ineffective, and that the longevity and success of the revolutionary regime, though it did owe something to that myth, owed to a number of other factors too. And we could, if you like, in discussion, talk about them. And the final point that follows is that the decline and fall of the pre, the revolutionary regime, though it has a discursive ideological mythical element to it, probably needs to be explained chiefly in other respects as well. So there's quite a lot of negativity in this argument. What cannot be denied, however, and I have a string of quotes which I won't give you, I'm going to have to cut out quite a lot of the detail, is that a lot of people regard the myth as very important. So we're not looking at an irrelevance or a, a trivial item. The mythification of the Mexican Revolution wrote Rafael Segovia, one of the grand old men of Mexican political science, is an omnipresent and indisputable fact. Eileen O'Malley wrote a whole book about it. So what I'm trying to do is get to grips with that myth and make some sense of it. Well, first, a few comparative points, because this was originally in a comparative panel, so I do throw out a few comparisons with other revolutions as I go along. Revolutions are supposed to usher in major structural change with a sharp break with the past. The French Revolution, which has become a sort of template for many later models, was powered, to quote Lynn Hunt, by a will to break with the past, the very invention of ideology, uh, and its chief accomplishment, she says, was the institution of a dramatically new political culture. 
So the idea of something dramatically new in terms of political culture and ideology is integral to many models of revolution. Now, of course, not all revolutions really were like that. The English Amer Revolution of the 17th century, the American Revolution, had a greater sense of prescription and historical uh, legitimacy. In the case of England, invocation of the Norman yoke, the rights of freeborn Englishmen, uh, etc. And even in the case of the Russian Revolution, although it started, as I understand it, with a more dramatic repudiation, there was a process later under Stalin of uh, reincorporating, as Sheila Fitzpatrick has put it, happens to be at Chicago, older notions of national sentiment and patriotism and the return of Russian history into the school curriculum. Now, Mexico is somewhat odd, but I would suggest therefore not radically different uh, in, in the way I'm going to describe. The revolution of 1910 certainly brought a period of profound conflict, followed by major structural change in Mexican society. So I have no doubt it was a revolution. There's a whole debate that's gone on about whether it really was a revolution or just a great rebellion. And I come down on the side it was a real big revolution. But the repudiation of the past, what did history mean and what did the myth tell us, um, was much more qualified. There was no great invention of ideology, no great cultural watershed. The revolution began, as Arnaldo Cordova argued some years ago, quote, with a burning defence of the past. And indeed, right down through the 20s, 30s, which I'll be talking about, and even down to more recent times, the invocation of history to legitimate the revolution was quite regular. As late as the 1980s, Alan Riding, uh, reasonably okay journalist who worked on Mexico noted how, quote, the past remains alive in the Mexican soul. I'm not very keen on the Mexican soul, but anyway, let that pass. History, revised and adjusted to suit contemporary needs, is mobilized to maintain the cohesion of modern Mexican society. You can find lots of other quotes to that effect. So how do you, we arrive at what is, in some ways, a paradox of a genuinely revolutionary state which harped on quite a lot about pre-revolutionary history, using rather prescriptive arguments rather than repudiating the past. Let me say first a few words about the armed revolution, then I'll move on to the 20s and 30s, and then, as I said, rather quickly to the subsequent periods. The revolutionaries of 1910, when they confronted and overthrew Porfirio Diaz's 35-year-old dictatorship, regularly invoked the past. Revolution was justified not so much as a leap into an unknown future as a restoration of a preferred status quo ante, which is why I think the use of French models of the kind which Francois Javier Guerra and others have tried to use doesn't work terribly well. It works quite well perhaps for the independence movement, but not for the Mexican Revolution. Madero and his respectable, literate, largely urban liberals who sort of began the revolution Hark back to Juarez, the generation of the Reforma in the mid-19th century, those who had defeated the Conservatives, the French, their imperial creature Maximilian, thus guaranteeing the Republic and the liberal constitution of 1857. These early Maderistas sought not to subvert, but to make a reality of that constitution which Diaz had subverted. Had they succeeded in that, they would have brought about significant political change, free elections, civil rights, something roughly analogous to what the Argentine radicals achieved about the same time after 1916. But they would not have engineered a social revolution. Now, the fact that a social revolution happened, or certainly a very big social political upheaval, was because there were other serious social tensions, particularly, I think, in the Mexican countryside, which had accumulated. In particular, the central state had imposed its will on rural society, and agrarian Mexico had undergone rapid commercialization involving the expansion of haciendas, the expropriation of peasant land holdings. The victims of those twin processes of political centralization and agrarian commercialization now demanded, talking very schematically, a reversal of policies. And they posed a more radical, social, economic, sometimes ethnic challenge to the Porfirian government than Madero's uh, political liberals did. However, there was, between these two groups, a measure of common discursive ground rooted in history uh, which went beyond mere expedience. It wasn't just, my enemy's enemy is my friend. There was a bit more to it than that. Popular rural rebels often shared with their urban middle-class allies a respect for Mexico's liberal heritage. They favoured free elections and municipal freedom, both as ends in themselves, they were public goods, if you like, but also as a means to protect peasant land-holding autonomy. They revered the figure of Juarez and his fellow liberals. 
and they conceived of liberalism as a popular and patriotic movement which embodied enduring Mexican values, defense of the patria, representation of the people, affirmation of local autonomy. Indeed, this rather sort of capacious umbrella of popular patriotic liberalism even went further and could accommodate some of the working class radicals who first founded the Partido Liberal Mexicano in the 1900s. Note the, the liberal, liberal label. Now this popular liberalism embodied quite serious contradictions. It of course rather idealized Juarez and overlooked some of his clear failings that historians have pointed to, but it did make possible a, an alliance between popular groups and more elite or middle class liberals, despite their substantially different economic interests. The force of this uh, coming together derived less from any careful sort of cost benefit analysis or indeed any close examination of the historical record of Juarismo. Rather, it had to do with local family uh, and other sorts of traditions. Thus, for example, in the 1860s, Jose Zapata had led local forces in the campaigns against the French and the imperialists in the Villa de Ayala region of Morelos, same area where 50 years later his great nephew Emiliano Zapata would lead the great agrarian revolution of the South. So you notice very clear continuities by region and family. Patriotic liberalism could thus rally a quite diverse range of Mexican groups and classes. And in their eyes, Diaz was at fault chiefly for reneging on his own early popular liberalism. It was quite logical then to hark back to the restored republic. And the revolution of 1910 could therefore be depicted as a kind of rerun and reaffirmation of the reforma which had first brought the liberals to power. If we're looking for parallels in Europe, and I was doing this partly because the audience originally was quite diverse, it would not be something like Bolshevism, but perhaps more like a popular democratic opposition to Italian fascism based on the ideals of the 19th century Risorgimento. Now, this prescriptive resort to history didn't stop there. If the revolution reprised the Reforma, it, both of those also hark back to the revolution of independence in the 1810s, which had, of course, ended Spanish rule and created Mexico as a sovereign nation. As a boy in 1812, Zapata's maternal grandfather, Jose Salazar, had sneaked through the Spanish lines at the siege of Cuautla, bringing to the embattled patriot garrison those essentials of warfare, quote, tortillas, salt, liquor, and gunpowder. So you could envisage three popular patriotic waves carrying Mexico from colony through independence to consolidated liberal republic with the reform to the revolution of 1910. Now if this was quite a capacious umbrella, a lot of people could shelter under it, there were still quite a lot of people left out. The Porfirian regime and its creatures, the army, the officialdom, who had betrayed popular liberalism and created an order and progress dictatorship, time-serving allies, landlords, some foreign interests, and a very large, numerous constituency, which I will touch upon at various points, political Catholics. Meaning by that, Mexican Catholics whose politics were in some ways premised on their Catholicism. Now, plenty of revolutionaries and liberals were Catholics, but they thought differently. So the political Catholics are a distinct and important group whose numbers probably grew in the Porfiriato and after, whose politics were premised on Catholicism. They had never been wholly reconciled to the Porfirian regime. They repudiated the memory of Juarez. They wished the Reforma had never happened. In some cases, they even regretted that the stable, God-fearing Spanish colony had given way to the chaotic anti-clerical republic. So just as the revolutionaries could see the revolution as a third wave in a progressive patriotic sequence, 1810, 1850s, 1910s, so some of their clerical Catholic enemies regarded it as a final fall from grace, compounding the errors first of independence and then of the Reforma. Indeed, you could even build in, if you want to push this even further, another argument, another stage going right back to the conquest and look at the way liberals, particularly the more indicanista liberals, viewed the original Spanish conquest as compared to the, some of their Catholic enemies. I won't go into that. However, the bonds of ideology which loosely united these disparate groups in the first revolutionary alliance soon came apart. Madero had a winning coalition against Diaz. That cracked up during his regime. Carranza, in some ways, in 1913, reconstituted it. That fell apart in 1914 to 15. So a common attachment to patriotic liberalism could not counteract the centrifugal forces of class, region, and factionalism. 
Zapata's agrarian revolutionaries wanted swift land reform. They spurned Madero and Carranza, as did Serrano, sort of loosely Highland autonomous rebels who had no desire to replace the centralizing Porfirian state with an equally centralizing revolutionary state. They were, if you like, trying to reject the classic Tocquevillian sequence of revolutions whereby a centralizing old regime produces an even more centralizing revolutionary regime. So factional and other affiliations pried apart the great national coalitions. And meanwhile, at the grassroots during the revolution, local loyalties, often, uh, pro which had prompted popular mobilization, easily degenerated into local squabbles, Huchitan against Tehuantepec on the Isthmus, or San Cristobal against Tuxla Gutierrez down in Chiapas. So as the revolution progressed through the teens, class, regional, and factional motivations often trumped ideological attachments. It did not really matter much that Carranza and Zapata both allegedly revered Juarez, or that the young Lazaro Cardenas shared much the same liberal patriotic upbringing and acculturation as many of his Vista enemies who he was fighting with. So there was a common set of ideas, but that did not prevent them fighting each other quite robustly. Now, the final triumph of Obregón, Carranza, and the Constitutionalists in 1915 did not, I think, mark a decisive ideological break. Counterfactually, had the Vistas won, as they nearly did, the result in broadly ideological discursive terms, I think, would have been not radically different. I don't buy the argument that the defeat of Vera somehow prevented a, a radical socialist alternative to what actually happened. So if, but if the discursive content, in terms of what the revolution would have looked like, was not so different, I think there was an institutional change, and that is where the Obregón Carranza victory was important. The constitutionalists promised a more structured, centralized, incipiently bureaucratic, and to use a rather ugly but useful term, a more massified state. Thus, during the 20s and 30s, uh, that state did consolidate itself on the basis of new institutions, labor unions, federal school system, the Ejido, the Agrarian Reform Program, 1929, the new official party, the PNR, subsequent different names. And these all lacked any Porfirian precedent. They were institutionally new. And that's what really made it, in my view, a politico-social revolution. If, on the other hand, we look at, as I have been looking at history, ideology, and discourse, it's rather less obvious that the revolution innovated in a systematic way. Certainly, if you compare it to the French Revolution, which, as Lynn Hunt and Baker and others have shown, did produce a new political culture. Now, to pursue the analysis through the next uh, phase, you need some sort of periodization. And the one I will offer suggests really three phases in the long process of first creating and then watching the decline of the myth of the revolution. Now, it so happens that the names correspond to the names used in Mesoamerican archaeology. This is purely fortuitous, but it has a kind of neat resonance. So I refer to first the formative period, then the classic period, and then the post-classic. The formative, which is the one I'm going to dwell on the most, comprises the 20 years of revolutionary reform, 1920 to 40, when the revolutionaries had triumphed, uh, they consolidated power, they implemented some of the social goals of the revolution, and strove with some success to create a hegemonic revolutionary myth. Second, between about 1940 and 1980, the classic period, a period when perhaps two generations inherited, enjoyed a secure lien on power, shifted the thrust of policy away from social reform in another set of directions, but still maintained, at least rhetorically, the myth of the revolution. Finally, we come, I will talk about this very briefly at the end, to the third post-classic period, the last 25 years or so, when a fourth neoliberal technocratic generation came to power, opted for yet another national project, and finally, belatedly, discarded or perhaps had taken from them the myth which had been forged in the 20s and 30s and rather triumphantly deployed through the 1940s through 70s, the classic period. So that's the periodization. I will talk mostly about the formative period and then quickly at the end uh, some briefer comments on the later period. So first, the formative. Now, the infant revolutionary regime of the 20s through 30s, as I suggested, was more adept at creating institutions than sort of radically new ideas. 
the government could bring into new institutions into being and did so quite creatively. The agrarian reform community, the Ejido, Federal Schools, Bank of Mexico, Irrigation Commission, finally 1929, the official party, 11 years later, the state oil company Pemex, just picking on some fairly obvious ones. Now, of course, the success of those different institutions depended quite a lot on the engagement between the state, which was creating them, and popular groups who were, in some senses, involved with them. And a lot of recent Mexican history has precisely looked at the relationship from the top-down policymakers to how popular groups responded, whether positively, negatively, or with indifference. However, when it came to trying to create a sort of unifying myth of the revolution, things moved quite slowly. In fact, it's striking, I think, how slowly it happened. No revolutionary school textbooks were devised in the 1920s. Vasconcelos, the first education minister, was happy to reprint Justo Sierra's old history of Mexico. And the expanding federal school system relied heavily on old Porphyrian texts and Porphyrian teachers. The commemoration of revolutionary anniversaries was largely the work of private citizens. Statues, which the Diaz regime had erected all over the place, not least in Mexico City, Long Reforma and so on, uh, were rather absent right through the 20s and into the 30s. Obregón, assassinated in 1928, got his official statue or mausoleum in 1935. He had to wait seven years. There was no Zapata statue till 1932, so that's a 13-year wait. No monument to Carranza till 1936, a 16-year wait. What about the famous murals? The first official revolutionary mural, Roberto Montenegro's Dance of the Hours, 1921, quote, portrayed elegant ladies dancing around an armored knight leaning against a Persian tree of life, the whole captioned by a quotation from Goethe, though not very much revolution there either. Furthermore, when the first famous revolutionary mur murals were painted, uh, the reaction was often hostile. Vasconcelos, their early patron, didn't like them. The press criticized them. The university students defaced them. One newspaper denounced this kind of art, Orozco's in this case, which it said reduced Mexicans to peons, Indians, and laborers, the very dregs of society. The government's disquiet was hardly surprising, given that the muralists were often using the walls of public buildings to paint graphic representations of government corruption in some ways. Now, this may have been art in the service of revolution with a capital R, but it was hardly art in the service of the revolutionary regime. Now, there were several reasons why I think it was difficult for the Mexican revolutionary regime to put together a coherent, unified myth which people would buy into. First of all, the revolution had not, of course, been the work of a coherent, centralized vanguard party. The vanguard party, the PNR, if it ever was one, came into being 19 years after the revolution began. So there's a complete contrast here between, say, the Russian or Chinese revolutions, where a vanguard party campaigned, entered the revolution, fought, won, and then imposed its will on society. During the 20s, I would suggest, the early revolutionary elites, above all, had an interest in maintaining themselves in power in pragmatic and Machiavellian style. Indeed, quite a lot of recent scholarship has rather stressed the sort of Machiavellian quality of these early revolutionary leaders. The work of Paul Friedrich, also of Chicago, particularly in the book The Princes of Naranca, stresses the sort of Machiavellian model of grassroots politics as it developed after the revolution. Now, in pursuit of this goal, survival, the revolutionary leaders could use a number of weapons, outright repression, coercion, forms of clientelism, more creative forms of social reform. But the ideology which underpinned their efforts was really quite vague and eclectic. The early revolutionaries differentiated themselves from something they called reaction, la reacción, sort of reified all-purpose opposition, which they counterposed to revolution, which was good. But this was really quite simplistic. The most egregious embodiment of reaction was, in fact, not Porfirio Diaz, for whom there were slightly mixed sentiments, but Victoriano Huerta, the military dictator who took power in 1913, killed Madero, and set up a military dictatorship. Most revolutionaries could agree that Huerta was thoroughly bad. He was, to quote various opinions, a jackal, a Judas, a Zapotec Caligula, which is very unfair on the Zapotecs because... Huerta had no Zapotec in him at all. May even have been unfair on Caligula, who knows. 
I don't know much about Caligula. I know he made his horse a consul of the Roman Empire, which seems to me quite a good, good idea. But uh, Beyond that limited area of agreement, um, there was only, as I said, a rather loose consensus, the idea that the revolution did not subvert Mexico's historical trajectory so much as consummate it with this uh, neat sequence of independence, reformer, revolution, which meant, above all, the revolution could appropriate for itself the strong tradition of patriotic liberalism. Now, that, again, did lead, leave people out. Above all, it le left out those political Catholics and indeed, as the 20s progressed, one of the clearest features of Mexican politics, and I think this was quite decisive, was the growing church-state conflict, which finally broke out in the major Cristero rebellion of 1926-29. to 29. And although that conflict was sort of resolved in 1929, continued church-state, loosely Jacobin, anti-clerical conflict continued well into the 1930s, particularly in the schools, through civil society, through mass organizations. And I think what this did was to give the revolution a sort of Manichaean quality, a sort of stronger ideological commitment to them and us, the good and the bad, um, as the 20s progressed, and particularly as President Obregón, a much more pragmatic kind of president, gave way to Plutarco Elias Calles, a strong anti-clerical president, 1924-28, continued to dominate politics for a further five or six years. And I think Calles, with his particular worldview, I won't go into it, um, had the sense that, that ideas really mattered, that ideology was important. Uh, in his famous Grito de Guadalajara, a speech made in 1934, he referred to the state's need to take hold of the minds of Mexicans, particularly of children, of youth. And I think this indicated a progressive shift towards a more aggressive policy of sort of political some said indoctrination, some would say acculturation, certainly a more Manichaean view of how politics should operate. And this brought changes, for example, in the realm of education. Vasconcelos, who had originally been education minister in the early 20s, had espoused a kind of vague idealistic classicism. He believed that if you gave the peasants Plato and Goethe, they would lift their eyes from their miserable cornfields and sort of see higher and better things. He objected to Rivera's rather stolid Indians. He advocated images drawn from Homer or Cervantes. But Vasconcelos' successes in education were more pragmatic and ruthless. They favored a more practical pedagogy to make Mexicans loyal, patriotic, hardworking, secular, and by the 1930s, class conscious and socialist. So the school gradually became an engine of political mobilization the curriculum mirrored nationalist class-conscious concerns. The cosmopolitan classicism of Vasconcelos gave way to a more earthy Mexican social realism. Native artisanry and folklore, which had been boosted quite a bit by M amateur aficionados, including some North Americans in the 20s, now received official sponsorship. So the, for the first time, rather belatedly, I think, a sort of more reified, coherent vision of the revolution was systematically formulated and disseminated. Now, this didn't really happen till at least some 20 years after the revolution had begun. So it's a rather late uh, development. And there are, I think, one or two reasons that could be suggested as to why this took so long. Now, one very obvious one was that the revolution, the armed revolution, had been a bitter inter nissan struggle with winners and losers. And particularly after 1914, the winners and losers were on the revolutionary side. It was a civil war amongst revolutionaries. And a quick roll call of the dead rather illustrates this. You have Zapata killed in treacherous fashion by the minions of Carranza. Carranza, a year later, killed roughly by Obregonistas. You later have a clutch of Carancistas exiled at the time of the De La Huerta revolt. You have Villa gunned down in the streets of Paral by hitman hired almost certainly by the government. Now, it's true that as you come into the 20s and the 30s, these magnicidios, these killings of the top revolutionaries, rather fade away, although later in the 1990s there was a slight reversal of this. Uh, nevertheless, I think it was crucial uh, through the 20s and 30s that Mexican revolutionaries often saw their faction as very important. They belonged to particular groups. Thus, the notion of a homogenous revolution was rather hard to uh, develop. And the individual leaders and their factions had their intellectuals, their sort of factional organic intellectuals, if you like, who would write and put their particular case. 
and at times of notable anniversaries like the death of Zapata, the Zapatistas would criticize the Carancistas, the Carancistas would criticize the Obregonistas, uh, and so on. When JWF Dulles, American historian, interviewed Aaron Science in 1955 in his house in Mexico City, he saw a room which was in a way dedicated to the memory of Obregon. It was like a shrine to Obregon, and Dulles recalls how sort of tears sprung to Aaron Science's eyes as he recalled um, his recollections of the great one-armed Caldeo of the Revolution who had been dead for, uh, what, something like 30 years. So factional loyalties ran quite deep. And this clearly compromised the capacity of the state to create an orderly, sort of homogenous view of the uh, revolution. Now, of course, other revolutions have faced similar problems. How do you turn what is often a very messy conflict into some sort of coherent ideology under uh, uh, backing a coherent regime? But again, in Russia or China, things were different. First, because the victorious revolutionaries had a rather more coherent ideology to work with, Marxism. Now, of course, you could commit all sorts of contradictory policies in the name of Marxism, but there was a kind of canon that you could draw upon. The Mexican Revolution had its so-called ideology that was very shifting, loose, and eclectic. And secondly, more importantly, the revolutionary victors in Russia or China had the will and the capacity to enforce uniformity, even if people didn't like it. And so the political careers of people like Stalin and Mao were much longer and more ruthless than those of Mexican presidents, who, for one thing, had to come and go. The rule of no re-election was fairly uh, well enforced. And furthermore, in Mexico, those leaders faced a much more diverse, plural, and recalcitrant society. So while Mexican elites feuded and sometimes killed each other, they did so in a political arena that was more pluralist, more decentralized than the arena in which, for example, Stalin systematically slaughtered uh, his opponents. And this diversity, this pluralism, is also evident, say, with art, with the murals. I don't know much about Soviet socialist realist art, but I'm fairly sure that the people like Rivera Orozco would not have got away with what they did in Mexico had they been working in the Soviet Union. In addition, I won't go into this in detail, but in addition, it's important to remember that the political Catholics still formed a very large ideological group, intensely hostile to the revolution, could not be won over. Furthermore, the factional differences, which I mentioned in respect of the elites, went quite deep. You had the Zapatistas in Morelos, the Istas in Chihuahua, Obregonistas in Sonora, Cardenistas in Michoacan, and so on. Local leaders, too, commanded a great deal of popular support. <clears throat> People like Primo Tapia in Michoacan, Felipe Carrillo Puerto in Yucatan, all elicited local support and in the sense that they were also victims of revolutionary factional violence, it again proved difficult to persuade people that revolution was a coherent, uh, unified movement. And these local and regional allegiances went deep and lasted a long time. Anna Maria Alonso and Daniel Nugent, when students at Chicago working in Chihuahua, in Namikipa, describe an interview with Don Gabriel, an old viista, whom they interviewed some 60 years after Villa's death. They described the scene thus. Lying on a sagging bed, ill, nearly blind, too weak to swat the flies buzzing around his body, Don Gabriel said, what is the point in talking about the revolution? My general, Pancho Villa, is dead. And after a while, he began to reconsider. Come back tomorrow morning, he said, bring some mariachis who can sing Vista Corridos. Maybe I will then feel better. Maybe then we can talk about the revolution. Finally, at the grassroots, there was one other intractable problem. It was not just that Mexicans formed factional differences and divisions. It also was that in many cases, the revolution didn't mean much at all. Now, I don't mean by that that the people were locked into their little patrias chicas, oblivious of what was going on. There is a school of thought that suggests that, which I think is probably mistaken. Recent research actually tends to suggest that people's ideas of the nation, of what was going on, were rather better than that. The problem, of course, was that the people formulated their own notions, their own memories and myths, which often stood in contradistinction to what they were being told officially. This is evident 
in respect of some revolutionary groups like the Zapatistas. There's some interesting oral accounts taken of what they conceived of the revolution of, as being. Uh, it's evident in a number of corridos. I've got some examples which I'll skip over. Corridos which depict a rather more sort of cynical, episodic view of the revolution. Uh, a view of the revolution a bit like the good soldier Schweik, in which people are looking out to survive rather than to really implement high and noble causes. And this, of course, would be particularly true in those parts of Mexico where the revolution had not been particularly strong or popular, outside Morelos, Chihuahua, and states of that kind. So, for example, in one case we know very well, that of San Jose de Gracia, Michoacán, researched by Luis González, the year of the revolution, 1910, was remembered not for the revolution, but for drought and the appearance of Halley's Comet. Two years later, news of rebellions begins to filter in, but Luis Gonzalez writes, these reports had come to be regarded as something from another world. In San Jose and its environs, during this time, nothing much was happening, except for Elias Martini's attempt to become a bird. Elias Martinez threw himself from the top of a tall tree, flapping wings made of grass matting. He was nearly killed, according to some, because he forgot to make himself a tail and a beak to go with the wings. So what's going on in San Jose de Gracia at the time when the revolution is almost at its peak is very parochial and different. Five years later, the revolution had come to San Jose, bringing fighting, recession, forced recruitment, robbery, abduction, feud, and fornication. The people remembered 1917, the year of the new constitution, as, quote, the year of hunger. And the image of the revolution, therefore, is a rather arbitrary hurricane sweeping individuals as if they were wind-blown leaves, sort of image we find in the pages of the novelist Azuela, was, in a sense, true to life for quite a few ordinary Mexicans. And it meant, therefore, again, that when they compared their experiences with what they were being told officially from above, they obviously dissented. And so I think that that kind of resistance made it difficult for the revolutionary leadership, intellectual state, to really create a unifying myth which people would readily believe in. Now, over time, it's clear that something, some sort of progress did, uh, was achieved. By the 1930s, the state had begun to celebrate official anniversaries, so key dates in the revolutionary calendar, like death of Madero, death of Zapata, so on. Statutes were now going up, street names were changed to reflect the history of the revolution. The first official journal appeared, and in Mexico City, the rusty skeleton of Diaz's would-be legislative chamber was converted into the ponderous monument to the revolution, completed in 1938. That monument gradually acquired the ashes of Carranza, Madero, Calles, Cardenas, finally via 1976, but the iconography of its exterior was sort of resolutely abstract and reified. It displayed nameless, redeemed workers and peasants rather than any individual named leaders, which suggests to me an attempt, again, to sort of make the revolution an abstraction and not too concrete and personal. And there are other evidence of this which I'll skate over. Now, the success of all this, the success of sort of official state history making is, of course, hard to uh, measure, particularly for this, the formative period. It is often supposed that the myth crucially underpinned the growing stability of the post-revolutionary state. But it's really quite difficult to prove that, and I have doubts about some of the supposed evidence. Take the murals and the monuments, for example. Although the mobility of Mexicans has often been rather greater than historians have supposed, I mean, they weren't all sitting like limpets in their villages, nevertheless, the number of Mexicans who actually saw the monument of the revolution or the murals in the Ministry of Education must have been a tiny proportion of the total population. Furthermore, not all of them were impressed. The monument of the revolution looked, in the words of one observer, like the world's biggest gas station. And when it came to collecting money to pay for it, hardly anybody coughed up. Pretty much the state and the party had to pay for it. Changing school textbooks or street names could be a rather messy and unpopular process. We know of examples where the people either ignored the change or protested about it. And so I think that the notion that top-down state building and myth-making was successful is something we need to, be, to take a little cautiously. In my view, the biggest contribution, I'm not sure I can prove this, a kind of more of a hunch, is that the school system, which was 
significantly expanded, particularly into the countryside in the 1930s, was the biggest and most effective way of gradually disseminating these myths and ideas, which meant both commemorating, but at the same time forgetting, glossing over certain things, as Renan said a long time about, about nations, so of revolutions, it's partly a question of remembering, but also of blurring over and sometimes forgetting some of the obstacles to revolutionary cohesion. So I think that over time, some progress was made, and we can see that if, in order to speed up my <coughs> progress a bit, we conclude what I'm calling the formative period and move into the classic period of the 1940s through to about 1980. Now, I can be very brief in dealing with both this period and what follows, but I think it is quite interesting to see uh, how things went thereafter. As we enter the 1940s, 50s, 60s, there is somewhat better evidence that the myth of the revolution, the idea of a progressive, purposive, popular, good revolution, had begun to take root. We actually have some survey data, for what it's worth, that tells us that is the case. Now, during that period, of course, if we take, say, the 50s and 60s as emblematic of the classic period, the official party, the PRI, enjoyed, on the face of it, major electoral support. There was no serious threat to the regime. And as the rest of Latin America, in several cases, went from civilian to military rule and back again, Mexico remained fairly stable with a consistent political regime and rather impressive rates of economic growth coupled with low inflation. During this period, the myth of the revolution, which we know about, really crystallized. More statues went up. The Instituto Nacional de Estudios Históricos de la Revolución Mexicana was created and produced a whole slew of publications, some good, some not so good. There was a fresh batch of new free textbooks, still nationalist and highly revolutionary, but rather less socialist or class conscious. Uh, now, again, we have to be careful to, uh, to jump, not to jump to the conclusion that this output elicited genuine, deeply rooted popular support, and that the stability of the regime depended on that popular support. In my view, again, this is probably in the nature of a hunch, uh, forms of economic growth, reasonably successful economic growth, plus quite effective forms of clientelism are the major explanations of the stability of the pre easter regime. Uh, the Armand and Verba data, which is one of the first survey uh, materials that we get in the 1960s, suggest, uh, I think the evidence is reasonably persuasive, that by that time many Mexicans had indeed internalized some of the values, some of what I'm calling the myth of the Mexican Revolution, that the revolution was progressive, it was good, it was beneficial to the people. But those same survey data also showed that a great many Mexicans entertained a healthy scepticism about politicians, trade unions, and above all, the police. So there was, in a way, something of a disjuncture going on here between an incorporation of the ideals of the revolution, in that respect you could say myth-making had been successful, but there was at the same time severe criticism of the people actually supposedly implementing those ideals in practice. And I think perhaps this is what we want to dwell on things like legitimation, rather abstract big concepts, perhaps this is what legitimation is about. The myth of the revolution had by now, by the 50s, by the 60s, won many converts, even if the same people believed the politicians of the day were pretty venal and corrupt. So the revolution in a way had emancipated itself from daily politics. Mexican school children, we know, um, had been the subject of quite s uh, serious pedagogical training, political attention for uh, several years now, and the Segovia research in the early 70s showed that they had taken on board many of the ideas of the revolution, they knew about the revolution, they knew about national history. And of course, by now, by the 50s and 60s, many of these people were people who had not lived through the revolution. They didn't have any of their own personal local experiences to compare to what they were being told officially. So perhaps that again, that passage of time was crucial in enabling a myth to crystallize and overcome the many differences and obstacles which had existed before. Now for the last um, 10 minutes, I'm gonna to turn to the post-classic, which is the period in which this system began to crumble and dissolve and the myth perhaps 
didn't disappear, but it certainly declined. Period of about the last 25 years. Now, since the 1980s, the hegemony of the pre and with it its revolutionary ideology have clearly faded. Challenged, challenges emerged from civil society, the political opposition, the changing global political economy. The old model was discarded. And finally, in the crucial election of 2000, the PRI lost power to a panista president, Vicente Fox, who was in some ways the ideological descendant of those political Catholics who had for generations resisted the hegemony of the revolution. This transformation of the last 25 years occurred amidst repeated economic crises, armed rebellion in Chiapas, and a renewed bout of magnicidios, of political assassinations. So the recent post-classic, like its pre-Columbian counterpart, which as you all know ran from about 800 to 1500, has been a time of troubles following the long relative stability of the classic period. Now, the causes of this, of course, are still being debated, and it would be rather rash as a historian to plunge in and try to say definitively what you think happened and why it happened. My own view is that it's a combination in part of growing political dissent, coupled with important economic shifts, partly within Mexico and partly outside Mexico. But some would also place considerable stress on, again, the discursive or ideological aspect. That is to say, by sacrificing the myth of the revolution, the, the regime really sacrificed one of its main important underpinnings. There is, I think, some truth in that, but perhaps not as much as some people think. So let me just say a few words about that, and then I will conclude. It's clear, in practical terms, that by the 1980s, Mexico was mired in debt, experiencing high inflation, and embarking on a program of privatization, free trade, and North American integration. The architects of these new policies, Presidents de la Madrid and, in particular, President Salinas, now decided that a discursive or ideological break had to be made to accompany these new policies. For decades, Mexican governments had mouthed revolutionary slogans. They sounded nationalist, reformist, populist, agrarista, and so on even though their policies promoted, more often than not, a rather regressive capitalism and growing inequality. During the 1960s and 70s, observers readily noted the great gulf which had opened up between rhetoric and practice, between the official line, the revolutionary myths and so on, and actual practice. And again, the Almond and Verba data uh, tend to corroborate that. So the neoliberal technocrats who came to power in the 80s, I think, decided to try and close this discursive gulf, not by returning to the old policies of reform or nationalism, as some critics like Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas and Subcomandante Marcos in their different ways advocated, but instead the technocrats decided to pitch a new neoliberal appeal to the Mexican people, especially to the growing middle classes of the huge cities. And it fell to Carlos Salinas, who, whatever you may think of him, was a, a rather clever, creative, if slippery, politico, to break decisively with the discursive past, with this loose myth of the revolution, to try to shift the pre's claims to legitimacy to a new kind of legitimacy based on first world, economic, and technocratic criteria. The Salinas project, which was broadly maintained by his successor, albeit in a rather more sort of low-key doer way by Ernesto Zedillo, embodied several elements. To the middle class, it promised growth, modernization, free trade, cheaper imports, more opportunities to go shopping in Houston, and so on. It also op offered a democratic opening, at least to the right, to the business-friendly, still somewhat Catholic pan. To the poor, Salinas offered Pronosol, kind of updated traditional populism. Uh, to the US, Salinas offered a free trade zone, it was his proposal. But to the democratic left, to the FDN PRD, Salinas was pretty uncompromisingly hostile. Now, unlike previous pre-presidents, Salinas was not content to change policy while continuing to play lip service to the old myth of the revolution. He explicitly wound up the land reform program, sacrificed economic nationalism on the altar of NAFTA, acknowledged the presence of the church, welcomed the Pope to Mexico, and so on. So there was a clear 
I think for the first time, a clear repudiation of many of the old principles and inherited ideas of the revolution. He did make an attempt, in a way, to introduce his own counter-myth rhetoric imaginario, that of so-called social liberalism. Uh, this was not necessarily Salinas's idea. He no doubt got it from some of his organic intellectuals. But there was, for a time, a great vogue for Sal Salinista social liberalism. Now, this had the great advantage of sort of skirting around the revolution and seeking historical legitimacy in the more distant 19th century and invoking historical precursors like Ponciano Ariaga who were sufficiently remote, obscure, and uncontentious. I mean, I don't think too many people knew who Ponciano Ariaga was, but he was the forerunner of social liberalism. In addition, and particularly with regard to history, Salinas promoted a reform of the educational curriculum, which discarded the old historical myths in favor of a new neoliberal Salinista melange. In 1992, of course, the year of the quincentenary, the education minister, Zedillo, introduced a set of cont contentious new textbooks, contentious not only because of the way they were awarded and the contracts were slightly dubious, but also because the contents uh, were radically revisionist. They eliminated old popular heroes, Carrillo Puerto, for example. They gave rather cursory or critical treatment to other traditional heroes, Juarez, Zapata, rehabilitated old villains, Santa Ana Diaz, neglected social and political struggles of the post-1940 period, and then came right up to date in order really to justify the wise statesmanship of President Salinas. Now, this rather dramatic rewriting of history in textbooks provoked quite an outcry, and in the end, these books were never uh, issued. And I think Salinas's attempt to rewrite history and to present a rather different version was in some ways rammed home with the Zapatista uprising in 1994 and then with the opposition Pan's victory in the year 2000. So it looked rather as if, by breaking with their discursive mythic past, the pre managed to shoot itself and lose power. Now, there is some truth, to conclude, there is some truth in that argument that the pre had depended on this discursive legitimacy and after the 1980s, that was lost. Nevertheless, it should be remembered that despite all this, Salinas was quite a popular president. Not when he started, but in the course of his sexenio, he became more popular. If you take most of the polls, uh, they tell you the same story. And despite severe criticism, opposition, and even uh, rebellion, the PRI won a reasonably fair election in 1994. Now, some people would disagree, but I think the consensus would be that when Zadir won 1994, with a reasonable majority, that was not a radically fixed election. So at first, it looked as if the new Salinista project, the new First World Discourse, also worked. Then came the economic crisis at the end of 94 and into 95, from which I think the PRI was never really able to recover. And that was because the new legitimacy required competent economic management, it required rising living standards, good economic policy, and honest government. And in some ways, the end of the Salinas period in 94 and 95 revealed economic incompetence, increasing stories of corruption, and thus a basic failure of a sort of managerial technocratic legitimacy. So to conclude, Salinas's dismissal of the old myth of the revolution, while it had offended some, gratified others, probably left others indifferent, did not, I think, of itself bring about his fall or the decline of the pre. His fall from grace derived more from economic mismanagement, revelations of corruption, uh, and so on. The myth of the revolution had progressively parted company with practical reality since at least the 1940s, even when it remained on the lips of most priester politicos. In Mexico, as in Eastern Europe, myth and reality had diverged, producing a kind of structural hypocrisy on the part of the regime and a great deal of deep cynicism on the part of many Mexicans. The myth was no doubt weaker than it had been in the past, but it was not defunct. And it still retained an appeal, but now in distinct, different opposition sectors and regions. We know this from the election of 1988. If you look at the Cartas a Cuauhtémoc, which Adolfo Gili edited, there is still a popular endorsement of the revolution in regions like La Laguna. Or again, with the Zapatista, there is a clear invocation of the symbol of Zapata. 
But by the time Salinas took the bold decision to repudiate the myth of the revolution, it had therefore come to serve less as an effective means of legitimizing his regime than as a rallying cry for opponents, for independent unions who demonstrated in the shadow of the monument to the revolution, an opposition party, the PRD, whose leader happily combined the evocative names of Cuauhtémoc and Cardenas, thus Indigenismo plus social reform and nationalism, and guerrillas who, denouncing NAFTA, raised the banner of Zapata down in the deep south of Chiapas. By the 1990s, the myth of the revolution, which had been carefully built up, as I've said, through the formative period, and perhaps rather complacently maintained through the classic period, had now been captured by the opposition and turned against the regime itself. Salinas' repudiation of the myth was part cause, part consequence of this new alignment. But I don't think it was the basic cause of the regime's fall. I still think the pre lost, less because its discursive ammunition ran out, but because it mismanaged the economy and proved itself to be grossly corrupt. At that point, the Mexican electorate turned to a supposedly better manager, an ex-Coca-Cola executive, and a representative of that old Catholic anti-revolutionary constituency that I've talked about, Vicente Fox. When I concluded the paper a few years ago in the middle of the Fox Sexenio, I concluded with a sort of throwaway line, I'll give it anyway, and I said, it remains to be seen, people could ask this question before I put it in, it remains to be seen whether Vicente Fox is able or indeed needs to create an alternative myth based perhaps on the incongruent symbols of Coca-Cola and Catholicism. Well, that was a throwaway line. I'll now conclude with a slightly different throwaway line. We now know a few years on that uh, Fox certainly didn't uh, create any alternative myth. He was a good candidate, but a rather feeble president. And indeed, it's not clear that he produced very coherent or effective policies either. But while the lack of policies mattered, perhaps the failure to start devising a new uh, national alternative myth is less important. Perhaps after all, this is the new final throwaway line, what Mexico needs is rather fewer myths, symbols, slogans from the past, rather more schools, hospitals and honest policemen for the future. Thank you.